When you think of aquatic mammals, your mind might drift to dolphins, whales, seals, or even a hippopotamus. However, there was once a peculiar genus of sloths that took to the water, adapting remarkably to life in aquatic environments. These were the Thalassocanus, an extinct genus of aquatic sloth that inhabited the coastal waters of South America. And not even these extinct sloths could escape the stigma of being known as sloth, as its name translates to the lazy one of the sea. Now that's just unfortunate. Thalassocanus was first formally described in 1995 by Christian D. Museon and H. Gregory MacDonald with the species T. natans. The genus was subsequently expanded with the discovery of additional species. T. littoralis was described in 2002 from a nearly complete skull. T. calamartini was also described in 2002 identified from a skull and hands. T. antiquus was added in 2003 based on a specimen which included a skull, a jaw and most of the body that was noted to be badly damaged. Finally, T. ascensus was described in 2004 from a nearly complete skeleton and skull. These discoveries span the late Miocene to the end of the Pliocene, which is evident across various strata of the Pisco Formation in Peru. The taxonomic classification of this water slot has seen several revisions over the decades. Initially in 1968, Robert Hofstetter characterized undescribed sloth remains under the family Megatheridae, aligning them with the subfamily Planopsinae. In 1995, following the official species description, the classification was updated to place them in the new subfamily Nothotheridae. This subfamily was later elevated to the family level as Nothotheridae, which which occurred in 2004. This then introduced a new subfamily being Thalassocinae. However, in 2017, the genus was moved back into the family Megatheridae. Now, you might be just wanting a break from all this, so luckily we can wrap this up. Despite all of these changes, a study which occurred in 2018 retained the subfamily Thalassocinae within Nothotheridae. Given the close relationship and basal position of our water slots within all these different families, it's very, very difficult to correctly place them, and it's still a challenge for paleontologists today. Thalassocinus specimens were mostly discovered in Peru's Pisco Formation and were documented over many geological strata, allowing them to be dated from the late Miocene to the end of the Pliocene period. T. antiquus is estimated to be around 7 to 8 million years old, T. natans around 6 million years old, T. littoralis being around 5 million years old, T. calamartini being around 3 to 4 million years old, and T. yacensis being the youngest, only around 3 to 1.5 million years old. Additional discoveries in Chile further expand where their living location would have been. While Thalassocnus is well known for its aquatic adaptions, new fossil discoveries in Argentina, which were far inland from the shore, reveal that it also lived on land. These findings were further elaborated in a 2021 journal article titled Unexpected Record of the Aquatic Sloth Thalassocnus in the Neogene of the Puna. I do recommend giving it a read. These findings suggest that early species foraged along sandy coasts while also utilizing land plants for food. The presence of these sloths in more inland locations demonstrates their capacity to adapt to varied environments as evidenced by a more thorough evolutionary story that revealed transitions between aquatic and terrestrial eating as they negated ecological stresses of their time. Being as their fossils were primarily found in the Pisco Formation of Peru provides us key insights into its habitat. This formation represents ancient coastal environments with shallow marine conditions rich in marine life. The region during the Miocene and Pliocene was characterized by warm shallow seas with an abundance of seagrass, meadows and kelp forests. Now you might be wondering how large were these slots? Well, compared to the ones we have today, we can say that they were far, far larger. The largest species is T. ascensus, which is estimated to reach a length of approximately 3.3 meters, or 11 feet. Following closely is T. natans, being the one with the most complete skeleton of the genus and a total measurement of around 2.55 meters, or 8.4 feet. Finally, T. littoralis ranks slightly smaller with an estimated size of around 2.1 meters, or 6.9 feet. As for weight, while it's not as concrete as some other extinct animals, but a lot of estimates place it around the 120 kilogram area. It also seems like sexual dimorphism may have existed in the genus, with paleontologists comparing these animals to the likes of elephant seals, with the males being typically larger. Being that this animal evolved for the water, it is no wonder that it underwent anatomical adaptations to its aquatic environment. These adaptations include robust paddle-like limbs, being particularly well suited for swimming and navigating waterways. Later species of Thalassocnus exhibited large fossae on their shoulder blades, elbows and wrists, indicating strong arms most likely built for digging. Moreover, the narrowing of the legs and hips combined with the limbs gaining a greater flexibility hints at a fascinating transition. It suggests a departure from relying heavily on legs for support towards embracing buoyancy as a primary mode of mobility. Picture this, a marine sloth perhaps relishing in the serene embrace of semi-submerged waters during moments of rest. Instead of trudging on land, it likely found it more and more effective to have paddle-like limbs. 
Unlike its terrestrial brethren, it dared to stand out with a plantigrade stance, firmly planting its feet flat on the sea floor. This unique adaptation surely lent it a unique advantage when navigating underwater realms, providing unparalleled agility for both paddling and propulsion. And with time rolling on, evolution slowly left a mark on its digit size as a testament to the ever-changing needs of this enigmatic creature. The third digit now a sturdy anchor for digging into sandy seabeds, while the fifth became a mere relic of its past, serving as a reminder of the evolutionary process. As for its head structure, while well, Thalassochnus possessed a long elongated snout with the forward facing eyes, ideal for grazing on underwater vegetation such as seagrass. Its jaw design had to undergo significant adaptions with lotus species featuring an enlarged premaxillae and a spoon shaped lower jaw which worked effectively for grasping marine plants. The shift in nostril position and development of a more extensive soft palate facilitated underwater feeding. Thalassochnus exhibited hypsodont dentition with high crowned teeth being specialized for grinding vegetation. The lack of canines shouldn't be too surprising considering that it's a herbivorous sloth, so I don't think canines would have been overly useful. This transition in tooth morphology from earlier to later species reflects a shift from cutting to grinding teeth, enabling for effective processing of marine vegetation in its coastal habitat. Its tail was characterized by its strong musculature and proportionally longer length compared to other ground sloths, likely played a crucial role in propulsion and steering during swimming. Similar to the tails of maybe a beaver or a platypus, the Thalassochnus tail was not primarily primarily for propulsion but rather for balance and diving, though as you could imagine an increased bone density was crucial for later members of this species as they became more and more adapted to an aquatic lifestyle. This denser bone structure similar to modern manatees counted buoyancy enabling underwater grazing. Over about 4 million years these animals evolved compact bones with nearly absent limb cavities akin to ancient whales. This adaptation allowed for submerged feeding with limbs contributing significantly to the skeletal weight. The rapid bone density development may have been aided by predisposition in related slots and anteaters, showcasing Thalassochnus's evolutionary adaptability. So it shouldn't be overly surprising with all these adaptations that our giant water sloth was primarily a herbivore, feeding on marine vegetation such as seagrass and algae. As we've already noted, earlier specimens would have foraged along the sandy coastline which is indicated by scratch marks on their teeth from chewing sand. With this it's been suggested by paleontologists that they foraged in shallow waters being around 1 meter deep. In contrast though, later species which lack these marks likely fed in deeper waters similar to manatees. These later species became specialized bottom feeders primarily walking across the sea floor and digging up sea grasses with their claws. Although possibly a peaceful animal, competition couldn't be avoided. Within its coastal habitat, our giant sloth faced competition from other marine herbivores such as from Cynerians which include manatees and dugons. Each of these herbivores had distinct adaptations that influenced their success in different ecological niches, potentially reducing direct competition. Our sloth's competition was adapted to warm, shallow waters and they would have primarily grazed on seagrasses. They had specialized flexible lips for uprooting seagrass and a streamlined body efficient for swimming. The ability to stay submerged for extended periods of time and feed on a wide variety of seagrass species made them highly successful in shallow coastal regions where these plants were abundant. Thalassochnus on the other hand had unique adaptations for an aquatic lifestyle that included dense bones which helped to achieve negative buoyancy. The success of each would depend on the specific environmental conditions and resources availability. In shallow waters rich in seagrass, Cyrenians might have been more successful due to their specialized adaptations. However, in deeper waters or areas where food needed to be dug out from substrate, then our water sloth would have likely had an advantage due to its ability to uproot these stuck plants with their clawed limbs. Cyrenians might have used their size and strength to push our aquatic sloth away from prime grazing locations. However, Thalassochnus's digging ability could have allowed it to exploit less contested food sources which would have reduced the likelihood of prolonged conflict. Yet, being that this animal is fairly large, likely slow moving, not completely aquatic and lacked significant defenses, there is no doubt that it would have been a valued prey item in the aquatic ecosystem that it resided in. Thalassochnus likely faced predation from large marine predators such as sharks. Yet an interesting predator which has been thought to hunt out water sloth despite the lacking evidence are the macroraptorial sperm whales. This would include the 4 meter Acrophyceta and the 15 meter Leviathan. The Pisco's formation diverse ecosystem included other potential marine predators such as the broadtooth mako and there was even the chance that everybody's favorite largest shark could have been a potential predator, this being the megalodon. It is important to note that we do not have evidence of megalodon snacking on these slots but there was certainly some overlap in territory hence it may have been a possibility. These apex predators would have posed a significant threat to our aquatic sloth as it traversed coastal waters in search of food. It just had too many weaknesses such as being slow moving as well as not having the right defenses in order to defend itself from potential predators. Additionally, 
when venturing onto land or into shallow waters, Thalassochnus may have been vulnerable to terrestrial predators such as seals like Hadrochirus. Though, as with most of the animals that we cover in this channel, eventually this giant aquatic sloth became extinct. The extinction of Thalassochnus, along with many other marine and terrestrial species, was likely influenced by significant climatic and environmental changes during the late Pliocene. The cooling trend that followed the closing of the Central American Seaway drastically reduced the availability of seagrass along the Pacific South American coast. As we've already referenced, being that they were seagrass specialists, the later species of Thalassochnus had evolved negative buoyancy to feed on the sea floor. Negative buoyancy requires dense bones and a limited layer of blubber, which would have made thermoregulation difficult in cooler waters, especially given the low metabolic rate of Xenothrans. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, harmful agul blooms could have posed a significant risk to these animals. These blooms produce neurotoxins that can cause paralysis, seizures and death in marine life. The decomposition of algae depletes oxygen levels in the water, creating hypoxic conditions which causes the suffocation of marine animals. Furthermore, harmful algal blooms disrupt the food web by killing or contaminating primary food sources such as seagrasses or small invertebrates leading to starvation. The toxins can bioaccumulate, becoming more concentrated and toxic as they move up the food chain. For Thalassochnus, which relied on sea grasses in coastal habitats, these blooms would have contaminated both their food and water, leading to poisoning and potential mass die-offs. Thus, Thalassochnus would have been poorly adapted to these changing conditions, even if there was enough seagrass for it to subside on. Increased competition with other marine herbivores and predation from large marine predators such as the whales, seals, and sharks could have contributed to its decline, and thus one of our plants and its most unique water builds went extinct. And now we've reached the end of the video and I hope you all enjoyed. It's too bad that Sid's cousin couldn't make it to the modern day, but it's still interesting that modern slots aren't too shabby of swimmers. Anyways, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you all in the next video. See ya.